we can start by um, you telling us how did you, well, first of all, your background as an athlete, because your background, you, you're an athlete, but um, just tell us from the beginning, begin from the beginning and <laughs> we'll take it away from there. I started playing soccer when I was five years old and I reached a, a pretty good level. I, I played in the highest U19 league in Denmark, also played against really good players, like for example, a guy called Thomas Graveson, who later played for Celtic and Real Madrid. So so I was pretty good as, as a youth player. But in the mid nineties, I realized that, um, yeah, I wasn't good enough to be a professional soccer player. So, but I was really fast on, on the soccer pitch and I was uh, had a really good uh, uh, throw in too. So, so in the mid nineties, I, I went to athletics, track and field and, and already the first year, uh, season I trained, I, I came on the Danish national team. Um, first, it was like only the, the 4 by 100 meter relays, but but the next uh, six years, it was all from 200, 400 to, to both relays. And then in 2002, I changed sport again. Um, I changed to the Danish national bobsleigh team. And yeah, a bobsleigh sport is, is a fantastic sport because you're together with your teammate around half the year uh, in foreign countries, 24-7. Uh, uh, of course, it's a tough sport driving like 130 to 150 kilometers per hour and sometimes you crash and so, but but I had four fantastic years on, on, on the Danish bobsleigh team. We were traveling all around Europe, but also in uh, Canada and the States too, for example, uh, Lake Placid and uh, and Calgary. So, so all in all, it was, uh, yeah, it was fantastic to do a lot of uh, different sports on, on high level and it was actually in in 2004, in the middle of that bobsleigh period, where I thought, hey, if I can make a good soccer throw in myself when I played, couldn't I coach uh, professional soccer players to be better at that too? So, you know, I, I was totally convinced that, that there was a lot of books around soccer throw-ins at the library. So when I came back to my hometown after that bobsleigh trip, I ju just wanted to find that book about throw-ins so I could coach uh, the professional soccer players. But there were no books at all and, and nothing serious on the internet. So, yeah, I found out that I had to make a course myself uh, from the very start, from scratch. So I used approximately six months from early 2004. Um, and I was measuring how can you uh, have a good run in? How can you have a good grip on the ball, the distance between the feet, the position of the hips and everything. Everything uh, I video and I analyzed that. And, and in October 2004, I made a throwing course. And I didn't really know, to be honest, if it would work because I've only like tested on myself and I could have been starting with a youth or amateur team, but, but I had the courage to, to ask a local Super League team in Denmark called Vibor. And luckily enough, they had a very innovative, uh, forward-thinking uh, head coach. He said yes, and uh, the players' throw-ins were improved a lot. The team scored a lot of goals on, on, on throw-ins, and that uh, season, the club had its best placement ever in the Danish Super League. So, so, so all in all, it was a, a success. So, so since uh, October 2004, I've been coaching um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, professional soccer teams. Uh, the first many years it was uh, all, mostly Danish professional teams, but but in in Ju uh, July 2018, I got my big breakthrough where Jurgen Klopp from Liverpool FC, uh, one of the biggest clubs in the world, uh, mm -hmm. called me directly on the phone to ask me for help for improving their throw-ins. It sounds totally inevitable that every team should have a throw-in coach because it's so it throw-ins take place quite often, more often than not, the most sensitive points, moments in a game during a match. So it just sounds like, well, of course, they should all be trained to really get the that particular action right, because it's so critical. And yet here you are, one of the first, if not the first pro league prominent um, throwing coach. So tell us a little bit about the breakdown, the way you break down um, the whole process and, and your training process and what it takes to become a good throw-in player. I'll say first of all, the, the first couple of years I was only focusing on the long throw-in. 
Uh, and of course, you can be successful with the long throw-ins, uh, throwing the ball towards the opponent's goal and scoring there. And, and and most of my players, when I'm coaching them, are improving between five and ten meters, and, and some up to fifteen meters, only with technical training, uh, no weight room or so. So so you can really go from really poor at throw-ins to being a world-class long thrower. But I only focused on that on that the first like two or three years. So it was actually a little bit of a coincidence. In my third club I was in in Denmark called Silgeborg, I was signed by a head coach who loved set pieces and loved long throw-ins and so, but then he was sacked like a few weeks after I was hired and they they, they brought in another coach and, and suddenly they weren't really using my long throw-ins anymore in the matches and and in training i could only like train two players out in the corner of the pit so even though i was paid and have a, had a decent salary i lost a lot of motivation so suddenly i saw one of these matches uh, for my club there silgeborg and i knew they weren't going to take any long throw-ins so i was oh that was a little bit you know boring uh, non-motivating and then suddenly i saw um they had a throw in in the middle of the pitch, like a normal throw in, uh, and then they lost possession of the ball, and they lost the possession of the next ball again, and the next, and then I was I was totally in shock because I thought that it was only like really poor youth or amateur teams who were so bad at the throw ins, so I couldn't believe it. Then then I, I went back home and saw the the first game I could on on on, on the TV, and I saw hey they were they were just as bad. Then I looked at all the matches I could from Premier League, uh, Champions League, uh, the, the German Bundesliga, and so on and so on. And I realized that most uh, teams had possession on the 50% of the occasions when they had a throw in under pressure where the players are marked. And, and I was totally in shock because if you have that possession percentage, when you're playing with your feet out on the pitch, you, you, you're you not playing professional. You can only play like Sunday league football, you know? So I started like researching uh, how can you how can you keep possession? How can you create space in different zones? Of course, I use my own knowledge from football. I use some uh, physical things from athletics. I used a lot of like video analysis I had from bobsleigh, but also used a lot of uh, knowledge from basketball. Um, because I, even though I only played one season in a, like a real club, I've been playing street basketball my whole life. I'm seeing a lot of NBA. So I used some years here to, to create what I call uh, the long, fast and clever throw-in philosophy. And, and I know this is not a, a soccer program or soccer interview, but I'll just explain it shortly. Again, the long throw-in, that's what I uh, told before. I'm improving the players' throw-in so they can, can, can throw longer, so they can either create a dangerous set-piece situation or for those clubs who are not using the long throw-in as a set-piece weapon, it's also important because you can say the longer throw-in you have, the greater throw-in area you'll have too, and then you can throw to more teammates. Then I have the fast throw-in, that's again, it's the throw-ins all around the pitch, how to react fast when you have a throw-in, uh, because if you're reacting fast and throwing fast, in many occasions, you'll, um, the opponents can't really set up their like organization and marking and so. And then the second part of the fast throw-ins is like marking the opponents fast when they have a throw-in, because that's who you also want to take the ball from the opponents when they have it. And the third thing around the fast throw-in is counter-attack throw-ins. You can't be offside on a throw-in, so sometimes you can throw it down in the back room and, and throw it to a totally free player from, from your team. And then the final element, that's a clever throw-in, that's how to create space all around the pitch. So I'm working with three different zones, around 50 different throw-in tools, like basic throw-in tools. And, and then also on top of that, the players put on their own creativity, fantasy, imagination. So it's not like a playbook in American football where we only take one solution. No, in theory, the players have have uh, millions of, of, of solutions and options. Uh, so so all these things, you can say all in all, I'm increasing the players throw in intelligence, as I call it. And yeah, so that's what I'm learning the players uh, with my drills on the pitch. I'm also doing doing talks for the players, for the coaches, and also doing analysis of the game. So I can really do like specific uh, training for especially that team. Talk about your experience with Liverpool. How did that start with Jorgen Klopp uh, reaching out to you and how is that going? Because that's super exciting. I mean, for 
uh, for any, you know, football um, professional around the world, it doesn't matter where you're from, Europe, Asia, Africa, to working with such a prominent and successful team as Liverpool. It was actually quite a, <laughs> a, a funny story with, with the call from Jurgen Klopp because, um, yeah, it was July 2018. I was on a summer trip together with my wife and I have two kids, Daniel and Isabella. And we were visiting a chocolate shop and I had like like turned my 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 phone down at least with the voice. And, and just before I went into the chocolate shop, I just want to check my phone. And I could see that there was a plus 44 number who's been calling. And, and if you have a company like me, there's a lot of people who are calling you, also selling you weird stuff and, and <laughs> do scams and so. So I thought it was just a guy from England selling me pens or something like that. So, so I listened to the voicemail and then it was Jürgen Klopp. So, <laughs> so if I hadn't been sitting in the car seat, I would probably have been tumbling over there. So, but, but I tried to call him back. Um, you know, it's always been a, a big dream for me to coach in the, the Premier League, the, the biggest league in the world. But it didn't take the phone, so so I went into the chocolate shop with my wife and my kids, and then when we came out again, uh, we decided to go directly home to take perhaps the most important call in my life. So I was driving the car, my wife sitting beside me, and then the kids in the back, and then suddenly when we were, I was driving, the phone rang, and my wife picked the phone up, and she said, it's Jürgen. <laughs> and then I just took the car, drove directly to the right into a grass field, and then I picked up the phone. And um, it was Jürgen Klopp, and, and he said to me, yes, we had a fantastic season in the 17-18 season with a fourth place in the Premier League and the Champions League final, even though we lost to Real Madrid. But we were so bad at the throw-ins, and, and I tried to do something with the team, but it didn't really work. So Jurgen Klopp invited me to uh, Millwood, the former training ground of Liverpool FC, and it should only have been a meeting like a week after. But after the meeting, Jurgen Klopp was so convinced that, that um, yeah, already the day after I had the chance to coach 21 Premier League players, all the players who weren't injured or at the World Cup uh, vacation after the World Cup. So, so yeah, so, so it was success and already the week after I signed my uh, my first contract with Liverpool FC. And, and now uh, I'm almost finished here with my third full season. Uh, and it's been, been been like a fairy tale for me, like an adventure, like a dream come true. Because one thing is to to work with the throw-ins, improve Liverpool's throw-ins. But we also won, um, you know, won the, the Champions League the first season I was there after the first time since 2004. And last season we won, we won the Premier League and that was after 30 years of waiting time. So, you know, it's it's not only been fantastic for me, for the team, but also for, for the millions of fans all around the world. I sometimes meet people who are coming to me at the street and, and literally crying because they are so happy that, that it ha happened, you know, at, 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 at that stage there. So, and now it's just opened up the whole world for me because I'm a freelance throwing coach. So I'm traveling all around the world. So, so the last three seasons I've been having like eight, 10 different professional teams. Um, across the world so so i'm living my dream i'm doing what i love the most um i'm also traveling all around the world so they, it couldn't really be better two things a do teams give you enough time for training or do they call you the last minute and also um who decides how do you decide who who are the best throwers throwers in the team which players or do you train every single one of them because you know, because they all need to be trained depending on the position that they end up with at a particular given moment in time. First of all, I'll say, uh, start with your last question here, is that I'm actually coaching all the players, uh, not only to throw the ball, uh, but also to create space all around the pitch. You know, because if, if you're standing there with a the ball and take the throw and your teammates are not moving at all, it's really hard to keep possession. So I'm, I'm, I'm coaching all players, uh, both to throw the ball, but especially to create that space. And then regarding the clubs, of course, it's um, there's no doubt that if I was in one club and could like, like train the throw-ins with the players um, one, two or three days per week, 
of course it'll be much better. But I'll say that in, in for example, in Liverpool, I've been there, not this season because of Corona, but the last two seasons I've been there five weeks per season. So that, that's actually pretty good. It means that I'm coming there for a week doing some sessions and then I'll come there again a month or a month and a half or two months after. And that's that that's pretty good uh, for me. So that's enough. But but because if I only if I only coach a team like like one time per season, it, it's not enough to to you know um, you know to to be so good as as uh, Liverpool has been. Uh, so so of course every, at every club I am, uh, I try to get as much training time as possible. But 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 for me, uh, like like five weeks per season, that's a really good amount for me. So but of course that's always decided. Um, between me and and the club, the head coach, the sporting directors, and so, so um, yeah. But it's always a, an exciting uh, project and and a thing, also a process too, because you know I'm a freelancer, so so you you pr- perhaps know it yourself. If you're together with a lot of people every day, then you know them, create strong relations. But I'm like traveling from one culture to the next, to the next, to the next. Just a technical question. What makes a good thrower? Like in basketball, obviously you need to be tall. In you know soccer, being everything <laughs> because it's such a unique sport. Um, you know, being fast and agile and so on. What makes a good thrower? Is it height? Is it a, what is it? Is it like having 20/20 vision? You can say it's it's really different uh, depending on you're looking at the long throwing or just a uh, throwing in general, like, like what I call sort of called a fast and clever throwing. If you're looking at the long throwing, there are different types who can do that. I often see players who are really tall with long arms or just normal uh, normal height but with long arms, they can throw uh, really far because they have a long work way with these long arms and then they can put more power into the ball. I also sometimes see flexible players who are especially in the shoulder joint who are flexible there and and actually if I have to choose between flexibility and strength I'll choose flexibility every day. A lot of people think that you have to bench press 150 kilos or so to to be a good throw. No, flexibility is much more important. Then I also often see like fast players who have fast switch muscles. They're also really good at throwing. And then sometimes I also say that there are coming a player that I don't expect will throw fast, who is not one of those like three types and he he or she will still do it. So so for me, it's, it's the most important thing is the technique and, and the reason why so many players can improve up to 10, 15 meters with, with my coaching is because they're like, getting the technique into the system. They can understand it. They, they're improving step by step. So so, so players are really good at, at, at learning, taking new knowledge in there. They're often also really good long throwers. Then we'll go over to what I again call the fast and clever throwings. That's all around the pitch, but it can also be a throwing on only 10 meters or 15 meters. And, and what you have to do there is to be a good thrower is first of all to know when to throw fast, but also when no to know when to have patience. Because if you're throwing fast into a high pressure zone where there's a lot of players surrounding your teammate you're throwing to, then it's not good. So you know have to know when you have to throw fast and have patience. But it's also seeing space being created, why? Because you know if your teammates are moving, you have to see not only where space is being created, but also what kind of space do you have to choose then? And then also precision is really important because it doesn't matter that your teammates are creating a lot of space. If you're making a non-precise throwing, it might just like destroy everything. So that's like the things I'm looking after. Moving toward teamwork, um, based on your own experiences of traveling and working with different in different countries, different cultures and different languages, now, football, soccer is a little different because more than any other sport, um, players come from around the world. You know, you have players come from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America to Europe and vice versa. You know, you constantly have this movement. But in general, what are some of the challenges that you deal with and how do you deal with them in terms of going to different la- different countries where you may not speak the language? And, you know, they have totally different cultural set up an infrastructure and how do you relate to that? Like some of the basic tips that you give to 
you know, young newcomer coaches and how would they deal with some of those challenges? I think there are actually like two things again that's the most important. First of all, as I mentioned before, be kind because if you're kind to people, open, open-hearted, open-minded, listening and and everything, then I think you're already gone a, a long way. Then I say the second thing is like you mentioned, the language is, is so, so important. And it's actually also one of my challenges because I can I can, of course, I can speak Danish because I'm from 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 Denmark. Of course, in Scandinavia, most of the countries are understanding each other. So, so I can also speak with Norwegian people, Swedish people, and so uh, on, on our own languages. Then, of course, right now I'm speaking English. I'm speaking fluent German, and you might think that being able to speak um, like. I don't know, four or five languages, that's really good. But actually I have a challenge because I can only speak a little bit Spanish. I can say like, uh, me llamo Tomás y vivo en Dinamarca, you know, but that that's not, not enough to coach in Spanish. I can, and, and, and I can speak even less French. And, and for example, in France, you know, I, I'm having a team in France um, right now coaching and and there are actually very few people in France who can speak and understand English. Of course, I don't know the exact percentage, but I'll say perhaps, I don't know, 20 percent or so. That that surprised me a lot. So when I'm coaching in France, you know, I'm, I'm getting a translator to, to translate everything. And so at the moment, I'm trying to 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 learn better friends like like online when I'm at home and so but but the challenge is for me then sometimes it's French then it's uh, Dutch then it's Spanish then it's so 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 I'll say again learn as many languages as, as possible but it, because it's not enough to just speak English because yes of course there are some some places it's okay for example if you're you're going to northern Europe I think like 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 whole Scandinavia, uh, Holland, uh, and so they're pretty good at, at English, you know. So 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 I'll say that that uh, being kind to other people and learn so many languages as possible that that's 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 really good. And of course, then there are some more complex things like like sharing knowledge, um, uh, things like that, helping helping people uh, socialize in in other ways than. And just to work and so and and so but uh, but perhaps we come into that later we so. come to that because uh like i mentioned earlier fascinated by the difference between your coaching throw-ins which are super super specific technical and you have a whole science behind it and your research into um joy at work which to me is the most sophisticated it just sounds like the most sophisticated level of professional achievement. You know, you have passion, which drives you to do something. You have uh, pleasure, which is, you know, it, it produces more work. But joy sounds very, very, on the one hand, specific, but the way you have described it to me before, you have turned that into a science as well in, in many ways, because you have been able to measure it, which was my question initially when we spoke last time. It's like, how do you measure joy? And you have managed to scientize that as well which is fascinating so begin talking about that research and the book that you have published and hopefully will be available in english because it's not at the moment so. first of all i haven't done the research myself I've, I've only been writing the book and taking other people's research so that's really that's really important for me to say but 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 the research is is <laughs> is is pretty fine so so for me it's no problem that i haven't done it myself but you know yes i've been uh, some years ago i i published a book in denmark called lazy energy um and and in the lazy energy there is uh, uh seven lazy principles and and it's not because we have to be lazy and but but it's it's more about clever laziness and so because there are a lot of people especially in the western world who are getting like like burned out uh, getting totally down with stress and so and and that's not good in denmark with with under six million uh, uh population uh, we 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 have uh, approximately 250,000 people who are so burned out that they can't go to work. So I think that's that's terrifying, and and it's best because it, <clears throat> you know, in in the world in general, we have 
been having these like things that oh you have to work hard you have to hold out you have to give it all the challenge is that 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 for me it's it's really bad to say that because no one can disagree to work hard yeah you will just say we worked hard and people didn't just say yeah we worked hard but what what does it say so 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 first of all it's not really precise in describing what to do and the other thing is that 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 working hard is is destroying a lot of people of course, all all people who want to achieve something, they know that you have to, to, you know, do something. You have to put in the hours. Of course, you have to do. Seven lazy principles is is our clever laziness. And and if I just should go into some of them, uh, we I have my first lazy principle um, called relax when you can. And it's not because you have to to relax all the time. Because we know if we're <laughs> relaxing every hour, we we're not really achieving something. But, but we know that we can easily work 14 hours a day. That's no problem. We can probably also do it for a week and or even some people for three months. But um, but then the challenge is that, that we are in a very big risk of burning out. Uh, the, the challenge is for our, us humans that we are often just looking one day forward and then a week forward. And then we think we can, we can really dig with, with this uh, too much work. And one of the reasons is uh, some scientists have found out that that the people uh, who are most passionate for their the thing they're doing, for example, their work, they are the people who are most blind for the for the danger sickness from the body when you are almost getting burned out. So a lot of people who are who are getting burned out with stress, they they are passionate, they want to achieve things and so on. Then suddenly they're down because they haven't really found out. So so when I'm saying that the first uh, lazy principle, uh, relax, relax when you can, then it's really important to be structured around your relaxation. So, so you have to, in, in your work day, you have to, you have to put in some, some small bubbles of total relaxation. Uh, you, I don't say you have to do yoga. I don't say, it because we, we, I think we all know what is, uh, is relaxing us. You also, it's not only about yourself. It's also about your, uh, if you're at work, your, your, you know your your um, the people you're working with too. So so you have to put in relaxation for them too. And I know that can be different cultures uh, from country to country. But but no matter where you're coming from in the world, the body can't really handle to to have the the, the foot on the the pedal, you know, or speed pedal uh, all the time. And and yeah. So and that's also one of my. The second lazy principle is called uh, pull the others down in the couch. And it's not about taking your colleague down in the couch and make him or her doing nothing at all too, but it's all about social relations. And um, we had this big research in Denmark uh, not so many years ago when they looked, they looked at different teams at work. And they, they looked at, first of all, who got the best wrestlers who achieved most, but also who had the most work joy and, and like motivation at work. And before that big research, they thought it was probably either the teams with the most skilled people who were best in this, or it also the teams uh, where, where the employees had uh, most ambitions. But they found out that the, the teams who like performed best all in all was uh, the teams where they had the the, the most, uh, or sorry, the strongest relations. And they found out, of course, the stronger relations you have, the more trust you can have in, in each other, the more trust, it, the easier it is to, for example, ask for help if you have a chance or give help if you have an idea or read an article and so on and so on. So we are often underestimating the, the power of strong relations. And, and, and we are often forgetting uh, to put in time like the relaxation on, on, on on strong uh, relations, so so because it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to 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 measure what does this this uh, thirty minutes uh, per week at work how how much does this give us? So of course it's it's hard to uh, to measure the, the importance of, of strong relations. So but but in in this research they found out that it's just so important. And then I'll yeah, of course there are seven. A lazy principle, so I'll just end up with, with the last one here. Um, the fifth lazy principle um, is, is called, um, uh, sorry, I just have to have it. 
Uh, on, I just have to translate it. I'll just say first that this book is in Danish. It's not translated into English yet, so so I just have to. Uh, <laughs> I just have to have the um, uh, translation of of that uh, chapter. But one of the chapters is called um, uh, uh, "Help if you can," and uh, "Help if you can" is 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 really like like giving help if you have the energy for it, because some of of the people who are who are like uh, helping other people too much, they're also sometimes getting burned out. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you 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 shouldn't you should help less because we should just help a lot. But the challenge is that sometimes we are we can also help help uh, you know too much and get burned out for that. And um, so so. There is some research on that too. And on the other hand, you can say that's also one of my other lazy principles is that that you have to um, you have to get help too. That's that's extremely important because uh, you know, in we've been told that we have to do things ourselves. Again, we have to hold out. We have to but but the challenge is that that, that sometimes it's um, it's much easier to uh, to ask another person that has specific knowledge around our challenge to to help us. What kinds of companies do you, um, you work with? I mean, what are the companies that see the value in what you have to offer in this particular uh, research and field of expertise? For me, it doesn't matter if it's, it's like a small company who are interested in uh, online, online talk or I have to travel to the country. Sometimes I also do the really big, I've done uh, several talks for, for example, Lego. Um, yeah, you probably all know Lego, yeah, so that's a big company. It did, did the last year in March here. So uh, that's, of course, always exciting to work with the really big companies because, you know, uh, they are also work with, with big numbers and influence a lot of things, uh, not only economy and so, 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 so for me, it's not so important what kind of, uh, you know, company it is, I just want, I, for me, it's, it's, it's more fun to, to work with, with the companies who are, who are forward thinking, innovative, but that can, can might as well just also be a, be a, be a small company than, than, a, than a big company. Your Lazy Energy book, is it being translated into English and other languages? Because I think especially in this era of the pandemic, everyone's not only super, super anxious, there's a lot of anxiety and stress all around the globe. There's, there's no one that's immune to it. No country or culture is immune to it or from it. Um, and also, People working at home remotely so much, we're we're all trying to balance. How do we, like, when are we being productive? When are we being lazy? When are we, how to measure that? And I think your concept of lazy energy can benefit so many people. So is your book being translated? And how do you approach, how do you plan to reach sort of the, the most number of people? Like all those, all of us <laughs> who really need your advice so how does that work first of all i'll say if you ask me two years ago i'll say to you for sure i'll translate uh lazy energy into english too um and i'm not saying that that it'll never be translated but but the chance for me personally is that since i got my international breakthrough in in um in 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 the soccer sport as a throwing coach you know i've been seeing like uh innovative forward thinking and people are like all the time asking for that subject and I'm talking with with people every day you know uh, yesterday it was uh, so, uh, someone from India and so so it's all countries in the world so so even though I think you're totally right that this this subject around lazy energy will, will benefit many people I might just, uh, I, and I'm already writing it, but I might just write a, a book about like innovation or unused resources and so. What is your dream project that you're not working on now? I mean, you have the book, you have all these fantastic themes that you're working with. I mean, total dream come true. Um, like talk about that, um, possibly the throw-in academy where you get to coach other coaches and have them and hire them out. I don't know how that works. <laughs> but my biggest dream and, and, and goal is actually to change uh, soccer so we have much better throw-ins. 
my challenge at the moment is that that a lot of a lot of people around the world, uh, youth coaches, amateur coaches, boys, girls, men, women, coaches, they're like asking for my knowledge around throw-ins and. And the challenge for me at the moment is that that I can't really give it because right now I'm only helping my professional clubs, but I can also feel because I I, I know it can. Right now I'm changing the the soccer world with better throw-ins, but but when I'm publishing my book about throw-ins, when I'm when I when I do that, I'm also giving online courses, and, and then my big dream is to to travel the world, both to to educate the coaches themselves, but I might as well also, like you said, educate other throwing coaches. And when do I do that? Perhaps in a year, perhaps in five years, perhaps in three years, I don't know yet, but that's like really my, my biggest project. Um, let me just give an example. On my homepage, I'm, I'm giving like my f- four best basic throwing drills. Uh, for soccer coaches and when I started with that I thought hey uh, how many would be interested in that and that was like I, I set it up like last summer but already now there are over 4,200 coaches from all all around the world who are picking them up and it's from more than 160 different countries so you know it's it's like it, this this thing is just spreading and spreading and and so 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 again back to your question my, I'm just really looking forward to publishing my throwing books, giving courses. So I'm not only focusing on 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 the professional clubs. So so that'll, that'll I think that'll uh, probably be my my next dream. Um, I wish to come true. I also have a little a little short story around my when I set the, the official Guinness World Record uh, World Longest Throw in 2010. I like to share that too. Um, and, and before I start with it, I'll say that some people think that that we 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 can't achieve this because we we can't really uh, we can't really uh, you know do any of these things that that you have to do to achieve this. But to give an example, in 2008, I had been a, a soccer throwing coach for four years, and um, yeah, I thought, hey, it could be pretty cool to have the longest throwing in the world too. So there were, I knew there was a official Guinness World Record set by Mike Lochner from the States in 1998, and the world record record was on 48.17 meters, and I can throw approximately 42, and that's really far because the best of my pro players they can throw 35, then it's really world class. But I also knew that I couldn't beat 48 because I was pretty strong and I was also having a good technique. So one day I suddenly saw um, a little girl on YouTube doing a flip throw in. And a flip throw in is, is where you're taking a run in, jumping down on the ball, do the flip, land, and then throw the ball. And I thought, hey, that's just just totally crazy. But 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 even though I'm a non-gymnast and I couldn't really I couldn't really even do a small tumble there, I thought, hey, how hard can it be? So I went directly down to my local uh, football pitch, soccer pitch. And then I, I took that ball with me, took a running, jumped down on the ball. And then um, then two days later, down at the physiotherapist, uh, I, I was lying there with, with severe pain in my back. I landed totally on my back and I thought I have to get some help. So so in, in a six months period of time, I had help from three different gymnast coaches who learned me, the first one learned me to go up on a handstand, the second one to do a flip without the ball, and then the third one, that was actually the, the Danish national gymnast coach for the girls. So so he learned me to do a flip throw in with the ball. So so that was pretty cool. I did a world record attempt in the match between, uh, the national match between Denmark and Spain and the national stadium with a full stadium clapping me here in the halftime break there. I didn't beat the world record there, but I, I had a world record attempt more in 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 Berlin, in uh, in 2009 at the Olympic Stadium in Berlin in a match between Hertha Berlin and and Wolfsburg. I didn't beat the world record there um, because it was raining and I had to take a run in on on the the, the, the track and field uh, you know arena surrounding the the soccer pitch, but uh, it. It didn't break me down. I was suddenly uh, throwing 46, 47 meters in training, and I knew that I would beat that world record soon. But the challenge was that in 2009, there was a guy called Danny Brooks from from England who suddenly uh, 
beat the world record with a throw of 49.78. So then suddenly I was as far away from the record as I started. So so I was really frustrated. And first of all, I thought that, hey, I, I just make a world record attempt at the Danish West Coast because there are no rules about uh, about wins. So I thought, hey, if I can throw with like a, a, a storm uh, in a tailwind with uh, 25, 30 meters per second is really, really cool. But then I thought again, hey, it, it's not okay to beat the world record in this way. And then I thought again, hey, I need some help. Um, and as I'm saying in my fifth laser principles, uh, let the others do the work. Then I just knew I had to, to get some some resources in. So, but I didn't know how I should, should uh, improve my throwing. The only thing I knew that I couldn't really have a good grip on the ball because you know when you are like exercising, you're sweating your palms and if you're jumping down on the ball, you are, you can uh, get a fear of it, 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 it uh, slides and so away from your hands. But I didn't know what, what could help me. So, but one Friday evening, I was sitting on my couch at home. Again, I have a, a girl called Isabella, a boy called Daniel. And every Friday night, uh, they've been seeing Disney show and every Friday night they also been getting candy and then uh, Isabella is, is suddenly walking past me and I don't know why but I'm touching her hands and I can feel that they were a little bit sticky so I thought hey that might help me get a better grip on the ball so so the day after I contacted uh, the biggest uh, Danish TV station, uh, station called TR1 that's a little bit like yeah like uh, BBC or CNN or so, yeah, and um, and then I asked them, shouldn't we test what kind of sticky stuff that's best when you have to do a flip throwing? And they agreed. So so the week after, I came live on television into a children's program called Sum Summarum, and there we put we had three uh, soccer balls. We put sweets, we put prunes, we put licorice on the balls, and it took one standing throwing with each ball, and then a flip throwing with the winner. And the winner was licorice. So since then, I've been using licorice every time I'm doing a world record attempt, and that meant that I was when I jumped down on the ball. It was like I had a really solid grip because it didn't like slide. And then when I came around in the flip, I could also release it again because it was only sticking in a moderate way. So it meant that I was totally secure when I did it. And it meant that I, in, in, in June 2010, set an official Guinness World Record, world longest throwing with 51.33 meters. So again, my message for everybody hearing this is that it doesn't matter if you really haven't got the right skills you know, you can always get help. You can all, all, always get knowledge to improve your skills. And then again, if you can't improve in the traditional way, you can have try to think a little bit uh, innovative. So, so I used used uh, the licorice after that test in the Danish uh, television. You know, and it helped me. And it was a, really like, of course, a weird way to be, get a better grip. But you know, that was the best way I could get some help. So to all of you out there who are thinking, hey, I don't have the skills. Yeah, just reach out to people. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're super, super busy. And uh, this has been terrific. Really an honor to have you on board. And I hope you come back and then we can talk about women's soccer, which I would love to hear about, because especially because you said you took advice from women's gymnastics. Um, Licorice and MacGyver, which we didn't reference, which you talked about last time and how you took uh, inspiration from the show MacGyver when you were doing your bobsled competition. Yeah. So next time we'll talk about those issues. <laughs> yeah, we do that. I have a lot of things to talk about. Yeah. <laughs>